So you might have heard the phrase, born to be a soldier. This person was born to be a soldier. Well, I don't actually believe that. I don't think anyone's born into the world with a knowledge of warfare, a knowledge of soldiering, and, and from birth decides that that is what they're going to do. So how do we get from a child to someone who wants to join the military? Well, there are many different ways that society recruits people into the military. Obviously, it's been about 50 years now since we conscripted people in. So um, as far as the government's concerned, we're all volunteers. But why do people volunteer for military service? Well, I'm going to tell you a bit about my own experience, um, which is just one angle on this. You know, there are many different angles on this. People join the military for a whole load of different reasons and for a whole variety of reasons. You know, a bit of this and a bit of that. I grew up in what you could call a military family. My uh, grandfather uh, was a uh, career naval officer. He actually joined at 15 as a stoker, worked his way up through, became a, a lieutenant commander. Uh, he had five children, four of which were in the military, and numerous grandchildren. When I was a grandchild, I used to meet up at his house on the weekends, and one of the main um, sort of pursuits of the uh, boy grandchildren was to persuade my granddad to get his medals out. <laughs> my granddad kept these medals, I think there are about seven or eight of them, World War II medals, uh, in a dirty old envelope stuffed in the bottom of a drawer next to his armchair. And we would spend weekends down there badgering him to get these medals out. For some reason, we thought they were very important. I think maybe I'd pick this up from my older cousins, that this, these things were something special and that they should be looked at. It never occurred to me at the time to think about or question why someone who'd been given these medals might keep them in a battered old envelope stuffed in a drawer you know, amongst a load of, old, uh, load of old letters, load of old bits of, you know, bits of this and that. I think I only ever saw those medals about two or three times. I remember as a child asking my granddad why he didn't wear a poppy. Never really got an answer out of him. I used to say during the remembrance period or, you know, on Remembrance Sunday, are you going to go down to church, you know, and, and, and join the ceremony? Well, I don't go to church on a Sunday. Why would I go down at this time of year? And as children, none of these sort of subtle messages really sank in. We saw him as this hero who had sunk a famous German battleship in the Second World War, had gone on to serve in the Navy until about 1965. But there was something about these medals, something about him that captured my imagination. On a Sunday afternoon, we would sit in watching uh, A Bridge Too Far, The Longest Day, and there was a theme through these films. And that theme was that Britain was a great and noble country, that we went to war for the right reasons, and that the people we fought against were bad people. The Germans had carried out the genocide on the Jews. The Japanese tortured their prisoners and, and basically made them into slaves to construct railways out in the Far East. As I grew older, I started to read uh, Commando comic books. You know, the kind of 50 pence comics about this size. And again, the same stories coming through. Britain is a great country. Britain is a noble country. We go to war for the right reason and we win against bad people. As I was going through school, uh, I developed an interest in military history, not just British military history, any military history. And uh, the teachers even encouraged this. Um, during some lessons, I was allowed to go off to the library and read books about the Romans, the Normans, the Vikings, the, you know, the British Empire, all these sorts of things. And it's carried on, you know, I remember at Christmases, people used to buy me military books. One of the books I can remember was uh, the, the Marks and Spencer's Guide to Special Forces. <laughs> and it went into great detail, not so much about the combat side of things, but about the great tests that someone would have to endure and pass to get into one of these special forces the Parachute Regiment, the Royal Marines, the Special Air Service. And this stuff just became so important to me. By the time I got to 13, I was um, asked by a mate of mine to join the Army Cadet Force. It's a militarised youth organisation funded by the Ministry of Defence. I went along, you're given a uniform. You're told how to wear that uniform. You're taught how to march up and down. You're given weapons 
taught how to strip and assemble those weapons. Then you go into the range and fire those weapons. You get taught map and compass. You get taught field craft, how to attack things, how to ambush things. On the weekends and in the holidays, you go away to army camps where there are real soldiers there and carry out the tasks that real soldiers would carry out. And for me and other boys of my age, this is really exciting. Compared to school, where all of the tests, all of the, everything that you were sort of graded on uh, was academic. What can you remember? Which sums can you complete? You know, all this kind of stuff. This was a chance to prove yourself through your physical prowess. And it was something that was lacking in our little sort of childhood society. This chance to prove ourselves, not through um, sort of academia, but through our physical prowess. The other sort of attraction of the Army Cadet Force above other youth organisations, it might have changed now, uh, but when I was in the Army Cadet Force, we were allowed to swear, we were allowed to smoke, we were allowed to drink. You know, and as a 13, 14 year old, this is pretty attractive compared to the, the scouts or the boys brigade or whatever else is being on, you know, put on the table. Also, we were trekked differently. We were trekked by the instructors like adults. It wasn't like school. There was a certain amount of respect. If you carried out the tasks, if you um, turned up every week, then you were trekked with a, a respect that we weren't trekked with from the rest of society. As we went through the army cadets, uh, you get promoted, you get to tell the other kids what to do. There aren't any, many organisations where you've got that sort of level of power at such a young age. Also, the older cadets were going into the army and coming back on their leave periods and telling the stories about how great the army was, how exciting it was, all the weapons they'd used. And uh, for us that were still in the army cadets, we started to think, well, you know, I think that's what I want to do. I want to be a soldier. I want to follow in the footsteps of these guys. Um, and, and also, from a sort of academic perspective, it became obvious that to get into the military, we didn't, it didn't really matter what happened at school. Um, the army was going to take us. All you had to do was go down to the careers office, do a little test. They'd give you a score. And that score would then give you a list of jobs that you were allowed to do within the military. And we knew that it didn't matter what you did up to the age of 16, you could go to the Army Careers Office, do this test and you'd get into something. So as I went through the uh, Army Cadet Force, um, <clears throat> I probably didn't pay as much attention as I would have at school if I wasn't in the Army Cadets, because that's what I wanted to do. So by the time I got to the age of, uh, sort of 18, 19, I just finished school, um, nothing else, no other job interested me. When I heard about, you know, heard or listened to my school friends talking about what they wanted to do, go to university, do this job, do that job, they all seemed pointless. They all seemed like a pointless waste of time. Surely, uh, being a soldier, going to war, these were the, the kind of ultimate experiences. And also, this, this is the, the only thing worth doing for our society. This is the point I'd got to. So by the time I was 19, I would have joined the army earlier, but I was even skinnier and smaller than I am now. And I knew when I was 16 that there was no chance I'd have passed the training. So I, I stayed on in school for another two years until I was a bit bigger. Um, I went to the careers office. I did the test, got the result, and they said, oh, Griffin, here's the list of jobs you can do. Uh, there's about 100 jobs on there. And I said, I want to be a paratrooper. And he said, yeah, but that, you don't need much of a score for that. You know, you could do all these jobs. You could be an aircraft engineer. You could be a, a you know, helicopter door gunner, all these other jobs. I said, no, I'm not interested in that. I want to be a paratrooper. I joined the parachute regiment without asking how long I'd have to serve for, without asking what the pay was, what the holidays were. None of that mattered. None of that mattered at all. I didn't need to be shown a video. I didn't need to be shown uh, leaflets. I didn't need to be sort of cajoled by the recruiting sergeant. I was already there. And I think most of us who joined the parachute regiment were like that. We were what I would call an ideological recruit. So we weren't there for economic reasons. We weren't there for the travel, the adventure, all this stuff. We were there because we wanted to be in the parachute regiment. That's what, what mattered to us. I joined the parachute regiment in 1997. 
There were 35 of us in a room, probably a little bit bigger than this. Boys, really. And uh, an old captain came into the room, looked around the room and said, in six months' time, there's only going to be eight of you sat in this room. And I looked around the room, looking at all the other people in the room, all the other boys, men in the room, thinking, how's this going to turn out? Because a lot of them look pretty tough, bigger, stronger than me. And we started the training. And as we went through the training, people started to drop out. And it became apparent to me that it wasn't necessarily the biggest, toughest guys who were going to hack it in this regiment. It was the people who could put up with stuff. The people, in the terms of the Parachute Regiment, who could hack it. Obviously, we were all physically fit, but that, there was more to it than that. I want to go into a little bit of detail around what that, what that was. <clears throat> you might have all heard the term military ethos. A lot of our politicians are using that term. They think it would be a good idea to bring the military ethos into our schools. If you listen to a politician talk about the military ethos or maybe a general, they will talk about teamwork, loyalty, discipline, self-respect. However, having looking back on this and having been through uh, military training, I think military ethos can be boiled down to three components. And the first component is to follow orders without question. The first component of military ethos. Every soldier, every sailor, every airman, no matter what part of the military they join, this is the key part. Obey orders without question. So how do you get 35, 19, 18, 19 year old, 20 year old boys straight off Civvy Street with their own wants, their own desires, their own sort of like needs, um, to drop all that and follow the orders of uh, the army? You know, follow the orders of the screws, is what we called them, the corporals. Well, the oldest sort of method to get people to obey orders is drill. Everyone's seen drill. You go to the, um, how's, uh, the Buckingham Palace. You see the guardsmen all lined up there. Turn to the right, they all turn to the right, turn to the left, they all turn to the left. And most military forces around the world use this. Uh, during the first five weeks of training, this is drilled into you. So you take a group of lads off the street, a lot of us have been through the cadet force anyway, so it was kind of second nature to us, and you get them to obey orders instantly, without question, and all do the same thing at the same time. Turn to the right, everyone turns to the right. Turn to the left, everyone turns to the left. So that's the kind of basic method. Now they've been using this method for hundreds of years. Things start to get a bit more sophisticated after the Second World War in terms of encouraging, if you want to use that word, um, recruits to obey orders. Another method of getting people to obey orders without question is fear. How do you encourage fear? How do you um, make a, a body of boys and men fearful? Through punishments. In most of our lives, if we make a mistake at work, if we make a mistake at school, you know, there are usually punishments. Um, these punishments are specific to the person who carries out the offence. So, uh, it, I mean, I often give this workshop in school, so there's usually some school-aged people there, but, you know, if anyone's been in trouble recently at work, you get taken into the office, you get questioned about what's happened, and you receive some sort of punishment for that. However, in the military, group punishment is used. So if one person makes a mistake, everyone is punished. And what that does is it starts to build up um, a certain amount of peer pressure. Because <clears throat> if one of your squad is making mistakes on a regular basis and all of you are paying the price for it through physical punishments, through extra parades, all this kind of stuff, uh, one of two things can happen. The first thing that can happen is everyone likes this person and so you all rally around that person. Oh, mate, I'll help you iron your trousers. You know, do you want a bit of a, can I explain how this weapon works? You know, I'll do your written test for you, all that kind of stuff. However, if the person is unpopular or seen as a weak link, then you start to ostracize that person so that they don't feel welcome within that little squad. 
So you either help them or ostracize them to the point where sometimes people would be beaten up when the screws weren't looking in the middle of the night. Uh, and so it became apparent to them that they were no longer wanted within this unit. The punishments uh, that we received were mostly physical. Um, we, most of the orders were very simple, shouted uh, single word or you know, like very short sentences. And any hesitation to follow an order was brutally punished. Uh, one of the sort of like most common orders was someone or one of the screws would shout, corridor. Wherever you were in the block, you had to drop what you were doing, run straight into the corridor, massive long corridor in the middle of the block, and stand to attention in a line. I remember one, one day I was in a room doing something and someone shouted corridor and I was sort of like, I don't know what I was doing, sort of in the middle of something that I couldn't just drop straight away. And I was probably the last person to come running around the corner and the screw shouts, Griffin, where the fuck are you? And I said, I'm on my way. Those three words <laughs> cost me. Taken into the office, brutal physical punishment. And the reason for that punishment uh, even if you think about it, I was actually being compliant. I'm on my way. You know, I'm obeying your order. However, I'd thought, I'd stopped or, you know, paused to think and give a verbal response. And this was not what was required or wanted. And so I was brutally punished for this. Some of the punishments we used to get is to call it a position. And we'd have to, uh, they'd say, assume the position. And we'd have to sit against the wall like this. You can still do it now. When we first started doing this, we could only do it for about two or three minutes. At the end of six months, we could all do it for well over an hour. Got to the point where they'd say heels, and we'd bring our heels off the ground to make it a bit more difficult. Once we'd got used to that, the command would come down, chins. Everyone would have to stick their chin out. One of the screws would go down, punch everyone in the jaw. Or tongues. Everyone would have to stick their tongue out, and the screw would go along and pinch our tongues. And what they were doing was testing, testing us to see if we would follow orders, no matter what. So why would we do this? Why would we put ourselves through these humiliating, painful punishments? Well, <clears throat> that moves on to the second part of the military ethos, and that is loyalty to the gang. Loyalty to the gang. And this is a key component. So, within the parachute regiment, we were encouraged to hate everybody. We were encouraged to hate anyone in the infantry who wasn't in the parachute regiment. Anyone in the army who wasn't in the parachute regiment we used to call a crap hat. Because we had maroon berets and everyone else didn't, which meant they had a crap hat. <laughs> we were encouraged to hate the Navy and encouraged to hate the RAF. But I suppose most sinister of all, we were encouraged to hate civilians. These were the lowest of the low, the most despicable creatures on the planet, people who couldn't even be bothered to join the army. We used to call them civvy cunts. And when you, next time you hear a politician say about how the British military is here to protect society, here to protect you, remember that, civvy cunts, the lot of you. <laughs> now, why will we talk this? Why are we encouraged to do this? Well, if you're gonna create a gang that is loyal to the gang, so, no matter what happens, you will stick together. No matter what you witness, no matter what you're asked to do, your loyalty is to that gang. You need to make that gang feel special. And one way of making feel special is to make everyone else look like dirt. It got to the point where we were so obsessed with getting into this gang, this elite gang, so wanted this maroon beret, so wanted these wings on our arms, that we would put up with anything. And as people started to drop out, those 36 people whittled down to 25, 20, 15, it made you feel even more special because you had survived. We used to call it the Highlander effect. If anyone's seen that film, The Highlander, there's all these sort of like immortals running around, they chop each other's heads off. And when they chop the, the other person's head off, they get all the power of that person who's, who's been sort of eliminated. And that's what it felt like. Everyone who dropped out made you more special. And that loyalty to the gang and that, um, that demand for status that we had, that need to be in that gang, meant that we would put up with literally anything. Sleep deprivation, 
brutal um, physical punishments where we were taken out to hills and ran up and down, carrying each other until we were vomiting. All sorts of stuff that we would put up with. So we've got the uh, obeying orders without question. We've got the loyalty to the gang. And when you think about that, if you can encourage young men to hate the society they're from, what are they going to think about the societies that you deploy them to? So we come on to the third component of military ethos. And this third component uh, is dependent on which arm of the military that you are put into. And that is the removal of the barrier to kill. There's been archaeological studies done, academic studies done into this. During the American Civil War, 1860s, they've dug up uh, rifles from the, the battle at Gettysburg. Hundreds of them, thousands of them. And again and again they find rifles with six, seven, eight shots in the barrel. Now you've all seen those old films, all the soldiers line up, don't they? And they get told, you know, to load their rifles, so they pour the gunpowder in, then they pop a bullet in the top, then they ram it down, don't they? Get ready, they aim, fire. Well, what these archaeologists have worked out is that these soldiers in the American Civil War were going through the motions of loading their rifles and not firing. They didn't want to do it. They've actually worked out that only about 5 to 10% of infantry soldiers in the American Civil War fired their rifles to kill. Apart from the people who were loading multiple shots and not firing, there were many more people firing above the heads or purposely aiming into the floor or aiming into the trees so that they wouldn't kill another human being. Now this is a problem for the military. During the First World War, similar numbers, 5 to 10% of infantry soldiers were firing their weapons to kill the enemy. Firing over the heads was a big one. Also, people were making unofficial truces with the enemy so that they didn't have to carry out the act of killing. Second World War, same problem again. Despite the ideological nature of the Second World War, we are against a brutal enemy, Nazi Germany, fascist Japan, Imperial Japan. Still, only 10% of infantry soldiers were firing their weapons to kill. After the Second World War, the British and American militaries employed psychiatrists and psychologists to come up with methods, come up with ways of removing that barrier from their soldiers. Until we get to the Vietnam War, which was still a war of conscripts. American military, the majority of the American military during the Vietnam War conscripted. They could only get the figures up to 40 to 50% of infantry soldiers firing their weapons to kill through their methods. By the time we get to Iraq and Afghanistan, 90 to 95% of infantry soldiers are firing their weapons to kill the enemy. So what's happened? Well, some highly sophisticated methods of training. When I went through the, this training, I thought this was all tradition or coincidence or just a way of doing things. However, in reflection after reading papers about this, but also looking on my own training, you know, with a different sort of mindset and, a, a, you know, looking back on it and trying to work out what was going on. There are some highly sophisticated things going on. The brain is split up into many parts. I'm not a biologist, I'm not gonna to claim to be a biologist, but what I do know is that at the front of the brain is our questioning, decision-making part of the brain, the bit that does all the thinking, and at the back of our brain, just above the neck here, is the oldest part of the brain, the fight or flight mechanism that we share with all mammals. Now, if a lion was to come bursting through that door now, this fight or flight mechanism would kick off in most of us. And it would tell us to do one of maybe three things instantly. Freeze, run, scream, one of those three things. And we'd all do that without thinking. There wouldn't be any rational thought process going on. It would just be an instant reaction. If you've ever accidentally stepped out into a road and then suddenly somehow just spotted a car out of the corner of your eye and you, you just freeze, don't you? There's, there's no thought process there. It just happens. This is the part of the brain that does that. It's taking in information all the time and making decisions for you to keep you alive. However, if a lion came through that door, there are 2% of us or 3% of us who would attack the lion. Psychopaths, sociopaths, whatever you want to call them. Okay? It's irrational, doesn't make any sense. Who knows, sort of, from an evolutionary science point of view, why this happens, but it does. 
So what the military task is, the military trainer's task, is to manipulate the fight or flight mechanism so that a soldier, infantry soldier especially, no longer freezes, runs or screams, but fights in, on every single occasion. So when the brain is taking in all this information, subconsciously almost, the reaction of this flight or flight mechanism is always fight. Now that is done through repetition, that is done through uh, the fear that we've talked about earlier in terms of getting people to obey orders, and it's done through drills. And I'm not talking about marching on the parade ground drills, I'm talking about repetition of certain drills. So, an infantry soldier on receiving effective enemy fire will return fire, dash down, crawl, observe sights, fire. It's just a list of words. However, when you're drilled in that again and again and again for weeks and weeks and weeks, and when any variation from that process is brutally punished, it starts to sink in. It starts to sink in. So I am faced with lethal force or a threat to my existence and I'll respond with rifle fire, dash down, crawl, observe sights, fire. Other ways of removing the barrier to kill, distance from the kill. So the military worked out that the further someone is from a kill, the easier it is to do it. In the British infantry, you're taught or trained to fire your rifles at 300 metres. Does anyone know what a human looks like at 300 metres? It looks like a kind of a blob or a, a kind of triangle, a, a, a sort of shadow almost. So the distances are increased. And when you think about other weapon systems, it becomes obvious how easy this is. The majority of the kills in the First World War were carried out by artillery. The artillery uh, soldier doesn't even see what he's firing at. He's firing up into the air. It's flying through a few miles and killing people at the other end. You know, the uh, carpet bomber in the Second World War is not seeing the person he's killing. So increase the distance. Another aspect of what happened to us was the manipulation of language. I was trained as an infantry soldier to aim at the centre of the mass. Anyone want to hazard a guess what that means? Let's put that into English. Shoot them in the chest. Aim at the centre of the mass. Targets will fall when hit. So the ambiguity of the language used meant that nothing was ever explicitly said. I remember being in the parachute battalions, one of the battalions, and no one ever said, we kill people or we're murderers. In fact, one of our guys was in a, a horrific car accident where he had part of his brain removed and for some reason they let him back into the army uh, and he had this thing where he could he was like really honest all the time and he used to say oh we're trained killers and we all used to look at him going don't say that you know it, it was almost unprofessional but he was being honest <laughs> you know so th this removal to the of the barrier to kill is a really important part of military training so we're looking at the repetition the manipulation of the back of the brain and the use of language to hide the acts of what we're doing. By the time we finished military training, there were only eight of us left. If you'd have asked the 35 of us at the start of that training process why we were in the army, you'd have got a whole load of different answers. A whole load of different answers. If you'd have asked the eight of us on the day that we were sent to our battalion, why in the army, you'd have got one answer to go to war and kill the enemy. That is all we were interested in. This idea, this thought, this want took up definitely mine and close mates of mine, I can't speak for everyone, every waking hour. I want to go to war and kill the enemy. Any enemy, any war did not matter. It wouldn't have mattered if they said you're invading France tomorrow. It wouldn't have mattered if they said you were invading Ireland, Wales. Wouldn't have mattered. That was what we had uh, been indoctrinated into was that to go to war and kill the enemy was the most, uh, sort of the highest achievement a human could achieve. It was like going to the World Cup and scoring a hat trick. You know, this is what we wanted to do. All eight of us were sent to the uh, second battalion, the parachute regiment. <coughs> And I stayed in the parachute regiment for uh, six, five, six years. Deployed on operations in Northern Ireland, 
Yugoslavia, Afghanistan. And uh, in 2003, I applied, applied to join the Special Air Service. I won't go into the details about the training, but we're talking about another six month period of indoctrination and sort of reprogramming where about 108 of us were whittled down to something like 18. And in 2005, I was given orders to deploy to Baghdad in central Iraq. I deployed there. The rest of the British Army was down in Basra. There's about 20, 30 of us up in Baghdad in a sort of <laughs> joint US-UK Special Operations Force. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about a process that I think is uh, that we can find this process in all sorts of different aspects of our lives, in, in, especially in work. <coughs> and that process is compartmentalization. And that is when a big process is broken down into lots of easy to do parts. You could call it the division of labor. You know, you think about the production line, Henry Ford, all this kind of stuff. So this big process is broken down into easy to do parts. And sometimes the people within this process are unaware of the bigger picture. So they're just doing their little bit and maybe they don't see what's really going on. And if we want to have a think about this process, we can think back to the Second World War. People often say the Germans are civilized people, industrial people, educated people. Why, how did they carry out the genocide? Why did no one say, I think we should stop this? Well, if we break the genocide down and look at it from a, from a perspective of compartmentalization. It's a, maybe a French policeman who goes into a French Jew's house and drags that Jewish family out and puts them on a truck. Job done. Maybe a Frenchman then drives that truck to the railhead, takes the Jews off the truck, puts them on the railway. Job done. Maybe then a French Train driver drives them to the German border. Either takes them off the train or maybe they just change drivers. German driver takes them across Germany. Polish driver takes them to the concentration camp. When they get there, someone else takes these Jews off the train. Processes them into the camp. Another person shaves their head, takes their clothes away, gives them the stripy pajamas. Another person then guards over them whilst they are worked on very little food, very little sleep, terrible conditions, until they become emaciated and maybe infested with lice, and dirty and smell. And by the time at the end of this process, they are marched to the gas chamber or maybe to some pit to be executed, the person who carries out that execution is not seeing the family in their house in Paris, they are seeing something completely different, something that has been dehumanized, stripped of its humanity. And it is very easy for them, or easier for them, to carry out that final act. And everyone involved in that process can rationalize what they did. All I did was drive the train. All I did was shave their head. All I did was give them pajamas. Also, people can claim that they had no part in the bigger process. Well, I didn't know they were going to take them to a concentration camp. And so a whole society, a whole group of people can uh, deny responsibility for something that they're all involved in. And I am a firm believer that if it was the responsibility of one group of people or one person to take that Jew from the house in France all the way through that process, to watch them for maybe six months, a year, two years, and then pull the trigger or put them in a gas chamber, they wouldn't be able to do it. It'd be impossible. However, by breaking it up into small parts, we can make that possible. And that is what the state does on a daily basis. So what was the process that we were operating in Iraq? Well, the start of that process would be that we would pay for intelligence, MI6, it's not James Bond. He's not running around in a suit, tuxedo, shagging women and drinking martinis. He's making it known to the local population that if they provide intelligence 
on insurgents, people who are uh, involved in trying to forcefully uh, evict the occupation. I will give you money if you tell me the names and addresses of these people. In Iraq at the time, 2005, high levels of unemployment, goods are scarce, prices are high. If someone's offering $200, $400 for some information, if you know some information, you might hand it over. Even if you don't know some information, you might make it up. Who cares? I get my 400 bucks. Maybe you tell a story about a neighbor that you've had an issue with for years and years and years. Or maybe you tell a story about the person from the different religious sects or the person who beat you up once or slighted your family. Doesn't really matter. Maybe you really do know an insurgent and you give them their name and address. So that's the first part of the process. We take the intelligence in. That intelligence, name and address, maybe a photo, is handed on to a surveillance team. Now, if you're on a surveillance team and someone from MI6 gives you a piece of in information, a piece of intelligence, you're going to trust them, right? They're our guys. They're with us. Why would I not trust them? Why would they lie to me? It doesn't even come into your head. You just think, great, we've got someone else. The surveillance team spends time circling the house, watching these people. Now, if you've been told by someone you trust that you're going to watch a dangerous terrorist, everything they do becomes suspicious. So, the dangerous terrorist goes out into his back garden, maybe he starts digging. You're not thinking potatoes, you're thinking weapons. Dangerous terrorist takes a bag out of his house, puts it in his boot and drives somewhere else and hands over the bag. You're not thinking shopping or maybe a tool that someone needed, you're thinking that's a weapon and this is part of a bigger terrorist network. And over a period of time, you watch these people going about their day-to-day -day business with a suspicious state of mind, and you build up a big picture of what's going on. Who their friends are, the buildings they live in, where they sleep. And after a period of time, you think that you've got a big picture of what is going on, and so you hand that job, that information, over to the next team, which is the team that I was involved in. Now, <clears throat> I've actually spent a long time purposefully trying to forget military terms, forget military uh, sort of language. So in the press, this team would be called something like a kill or capture team. We'd be given, in a room like this, a big briefing, maps, air photography, pictures, names, and we'd be told, you need to go and detain this person. Now, people often say, oh, when you're in special forces, you get to do what you want. You get, you get to think for yourself. Well, you do get to think for yourself. They tell you who you're going to arrest or who you're going to attack, and you get to decide how to do it. But there is never any question about who you will attack or who you will arrest. So there is a certain amount of free play in that. We would sneak out into the night, maybe in uh, jeeps or helicopters, depending on where we were going, and sneak up to this person's house. And I just want you to try and imagine being inside that house. Try and imagine being asleep inside your house, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. It's dark, it's quiet, everyone's asleep in the house. Maybe your sons and daughters are in the next room, you know, whatever, whatever the family situation is. And the first sort of inkling you get that we are coming to get you is when your front door or your front wall is exposed is, is smashed to bits by an explosion. We would sneak up to your house, lay a huge amount of explosives on the front door or on a wall, bang it off. Your house is still dark, there's a huge explosion rocks through your house, your ears are ringing, there's dust everywhere, it's still dark. You're thinking, what fuck is going on? You're terrified. Before you've even got time to think What's just happened, you can hear men in your house, 20 men. You can hear them downstairs, they're kicking the doors in, they're coming up the stairs, they've kicked your door in, they've got you. You've been held at gunpoint, dragged out of your bed. All the men are taken into one room, all the women and children are taken into another room, you're all held at gunpoint. You can hear the males of the house being interrogated, maybe slapped around a bit, shouted at in a foreign language that you don't understand, 
whilst this process was going on, my job was to go around the houses with a big postal sack, ransack the houses, and take anything of value. Mobile phones, bank statements, passports, money, computers, anything of any, what we would say, any intelligence value, but also just so happened to be anything of any value to that family. This might take 20 minutes. This wasn't a careful search. This was just turning the whole house upside down. After 20 minutes, we'd be finished. We'd have maybe two big sacks full of these people's possessions. Go back down into the hallway and the men would be lined up ready to go. Maybe a hood over their head, ear defenders so they couldn't hear, maybe some goggles if they weren't wearing a hood, blacked out, and their hands tied together with a cable tie, you know, the plastic cable ties. And then we were gone. Out we would go through the hole in the wall or, or the hole where the front door used to be, bundle these people onto a helicopter or a jeep, along with all their possessions, back to our base. We would leave that family without any males and without any of their valuable possessions. Those men would then be taken back to our base where we would stand them against a wall and hand them over to the next team. We'd then go off and get some breakfast. That was our part, that was our role done. These men would then be interrogated further, maybe for a couple of hours, and their intelligence value would be assessed. Is this person really an insurgent or is he just some sort of like minor player or is he just a civilian? And then depending on what that intelligence value was rated as, they would be sent to another uh, prison. If they were lucky, they might be get sent to somewhere like Abu Ghraib. One of the big prisons, full of people. If they were unlucky, they would get sent to one of the black sites, one of the prisons, secret prisons, where Torture wasn't just, you know, sort of a random thing. It was part of the process. One of the prisons that British forces used in Iraq at Baghdad International Airport, we held people in dog kennels in the sun, out in the sun, and then dragged them off into uh, shipping containers to torture. There were British RAF, not soldiers, airmen, who were tasked with... Uh, guarding this prison camp. There were British officers who went into those torture interrogations and fed questions in and took information out. That was the process that we were running in Iraq. One where everyone could just say I was doing my job. No one got to see what was going on. I never went to one of these secret prisons. I never physically saw someone being tortured. The MI6 guy never saw us raiding that person's house. And this is what we were doing. And this started to have an effect on me. As someone who'd grown up watching those films, asking my granddad, can I see your medals? Reading those comic books. Britain is a good country. Britain fights bad people. We go to war for the right reasons. Going to those people's night after night into their houses and destroying their lives started to have an effect. We got sent <clears throat> on a job outside of Fallujah one night. We, I think we were in helicopters that night and we got into someone's house and I could hear the radio communications going on. I think I was in one of the helicopters just circling that night. And our guys had got in there and interrogated a, uh, a young man with his young family. And it turned out that he had said to them that he had had enough of the war. He wasn't an insurgent. He'd actually uh, got this farm off his uncle because he wanted to get out of Fallujah and keep his family safe. And I think our guys probably interrogated him for maybe 20 minutes. All his paperwork added up. All the stories added up. And our commander on the ground that night said, we're not going to take you in. Got on the radio, told our commanders, we're not bringing this person in. The soldier will obey orders without question. When we got back to the base, our commander, who was a major, so not someone insignificant, was taken to have a, a chat 
with the next person up and told in no uncertain terms, if we tell you to bring someone in, you bring them in. The next night, another unit was sent in to get that same person. So you started to realize that it didn't actually matter what decisions you made, this process was gonna carry on. It was gonna carry on no matter what you said, what you did. Also, most of the times we went into someone's house, we were given a name and a photo. It was very rare that we actually found that person. It was very rare that we found the person we were looking for. We'd go into someone's house, they wouldn't be there, and we did one or two things. We would take all males of military age from that house, no matter if we wanted them or not. Just by being in that location, they were guilty into the system. The other option after doing that was that if, it, if it ain't this house, it must be next door. We must have, got the, must have got this slightly out wrong. I was on jobs personally where we went through three houses in a row in one night. A mate of mine did seven houses in a row looking for these terrorists. All of these males, all of the males that we found in those buildings would end up in the prison system. I reckon about one in 20 jobs I did in Iraq, we actually found someone we were looking for. All the rest of it was just people who got caught up in it. And I've read reports since from guys who were interrogating people inside of these secret prisons. And they reckon that only 5% of the people we picked up were actually insurgents. I started to sort of question what we were doing. When you're inside someone's house and the family are looking, looking at you as you're trashing their house, taking their stuff, and they're looking at you, and you can see the look in their eyes, and that look in their eyes says, what are you doing? What are you doing to me? Why are you doing this? It starts to have an effect. When you're taking people in night after night, who are not the people you're looking for, it starts to have an effect. When you're trashing all these people's homes and you start to think, even from a military point of view, aren't we just making things worse? If these people didn't hate us before, they're gonna hate us now, surely. This went on and on. Lots of things happened in Iraq. You know, I haven't got time to go through all the detail of it. But almost everything that was happening was telling me that this is wrong. Something had switched inside me and I was no longer willing to take a part in this. I remember one night coming back from some operation, I'd been um, put into an American tank unit for the night to sort of direct them to, they were in an overwatch over us. And as we're going back, I'm in the back of this Bradley, I think, can't remember what tank it was. I could hear this noise. And I can hear them laughing. I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, we're knocking the lamppost down. I said, what are you doing that for? Because, because we can. And compared to all the other stuff I saw in Iraq, it was quite minor, but it kind of summed things up. It was like, we can do what we want, when we want. There are no rules. And who cares what the people think about us? I started, I suppose you could say, to become quite a bad soldier. I wasn't interested, whereas before I wanted to be the first person through the door, I wanted to put the explosives on the door. I was quite happy to be in a helicopter doing Overwatch. Didn't want anything to do with this was quite happy to be out of the way. Didn't want to get my hands dirty. After I'd been there for, I don't know, three months, the CO came out to see us, sat in us in a room like this. We were getting orders for a, for a mission, um, some big mission. It was always, every time we were briefed, it was like, we're about to catch Zakawi, who was the head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq at the time, you know. First couple of times you hear that, you think, wow, we're gonna go and get him. And then after about 10 times, you think, really? <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the first thing that was of significance was um, a joint operation, British and American. We were given our rules of engagement. And those rules of engagement were the same that I had obeyed uh, since I was a young soldier in Northern Ireland. You will only use lethal force if lethal force is about to be used against you. And that means that someone has to be aiming a rifle at you or firing at you. Someone could be holding a rifle down by the side and that is not reason enough to shoot them, not reason enough to use lethal force. And then he went on to explain the American rules of engagement, which were, you may use lethal force if you are in fear of your life. And that is something quite different. 
Because no matter what the jobs you're on and the fact that you never actually meet any armed resistance, because if you s smash your way into someone's house at one o'clock in the morning with explosives, believe it or not, no one is up for a fight. <laughs> Every time you go through that door, you're, there's a, an element of fear. Of course there is. You don't know what's the other side of that door. And if your rules of engagement say that you can open fire if you're scared, that kind of explains why on those joint operations every night when we came back in, we hadn't shot anyone. And our sister unit had maybe shot two or three people. And once in a while you'd think, well, okay, you know, they obviously came up against some pretty hardcore insurgents who were ready and waiting. But when it happens three, four, five, six times, you start to question that, whether that's true or not. But the CEO went on to say something even more significant, I think. He said that this was the first war he was involved in that we weren't going to win. Quite interesting to hear from a CEO. And then he went on to say that he was worried that we were becoming the secret police of Baghdad. And for me, those words were like a hammer blow. I'd already felt this, seen it, but to hear it spoken by someone of such high standing was like a hammer blow. Thinking, you know, back to when I was a kid, Britain's a good country. Britain goes to war for the right reasons. We're the good guys, we defeat the bad guys. They torture, they kill indiscriminately, they massacre, carry out genocides, and we're the people who stop that. And I looked around the building that we was living in, and it was a villa on the banks of the river Tigris where one of Saddam's henchmen used to live. And I looked at the guy who was working for us, carrying out sort of uh, interpretation and brutalizing people in Iraqi. I started to think, well, maybe he was working for Saddam. And then you look at the prisons we were using, Saddam's prisons. You start to think, who are these people we're going after? Maybe they're the same people that Saddam used to go after. And it became apparent to me that we had replaced one evil dictatorship with another, us. And it became unbearable. It wasn't just me, there were other people who felt the same. I remember going into a, a slum one night, huge amount of explosives put on the door, we're all stacked up, ready to go in, and the roof almost came off. When we went inside the building, it's full of kids on the mattresses, they were all walking around, sort of like dumbfounded, couldn't hear, you know, like deafened by what we'd done. No one was killed that night, I don't know how. And a huge row erupted when we got back to the base about the use of explosives in civilian areas. We were always operating in civilian areas. Some people were saying, we should keep this to the minimum. We don't want to hurt anyone. You know, this would be counterproductive. And other people were saying, fuck them, as long as we're not hurt. So there was a real divide. One night we got sent out into a village and brought, captured so many people, bearing in mind that we were supposed to be after specific people, we were this surgical tool that was being used. We captured so many people that it took hours for us to ferry them back to the base in the helicopters. We got back to the base, lined them all up, old and young, I think one of the guys was even disabled, and an American intelligence officer went along, him, 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 right, take the rest back. It was almost farcical, but it wasn't farcical for those people that we'd captured. Imagine that. The people who were held ended up in a secret prison system and were tortured. The people who were sent back, what was their life back? What was their life like when they got sent back? Imagine the questions. Why are you back? What's happened to my husband? Have you cut a deal with him? I got sent home on leave. And every day, uh, I'd go through the same thought process. I knew that what we were doing in Iraq was wrong. Not just militarily wrong, because it was creating more enemies than we were eliminating, but also morally wrong. Smashing our way into people's homes, terrorizing families, taking people away to be tortured. And I knew that I couldn't do it any longer. Every day I'd go through the same process and come to the same conclusion. I can't go back. How, how am I gonna get out of this? And I went through all sorts of different options. At one point I was just gonna buy a plane ticket, 
fly off somewhere, not come back. I thought, I can't do that. Then I thought, right, I'm gonna write a letter. I'm gonna write a letter to my CO and tell him why I'm not going back to Iraq. I wrote the letter, I thought, I can't do this. So, after about a week, I went into the uh, regimental HQ, spoke to the clerk, I need an interview with the commanding officer. And he looked at me, he said, is this about leaving? And I was thinking, hey, is, he, is it that obvious? You know, has he been reading my emails that I never sent? <laughs> anyway, I got an interview with the CO. I told my girlfriend at the time, I'm probably gonna end up in the jail for this. And went in there and he said, Griff, what's this about? And I said to him, I was so nervous. I was more nervous going into that room than I was during any time in Iraq. It was like standing outside a headmaster's office times 100. And I was so nervous, so unsure about what was going to happen that I needed to keep this simple. So I just kept on saying to him, I'm not going back to Iraq and I'm not serving under American command. And it didn't take him long and he said, right, okay, well, we're going to need to sort this out. I want you to go home, come back tomorrow. And I was looking at him thinking, this is a trick, you know, expecting the trap door to open, got outside the office, are they going to release the dogs? Got outside the gate, got on the phone to my girlfriend, yeah, they have time to go home. Anyway, over the next five to, I don't know how long it lasted, two months maybe, I was interviewed by about five different officers. And at first they thought that maybe I was pulling a trick because um, I'd been offered a job in Iraq. That's what they thought, uh, with one of these mercenary companies. And um, it soon became clear to them that's, that's not what I was up to. You know, when I was in Iraq, another aspect of what was going on um, was that there were huge numbers of uh, white Western contractors out there. So people not in the military. Um, there was all sorts of people, oil engineers, electrical engineers, um, lawyers, bankers, the, the whole sort of spectrum of Western corporate interests. And they were all guarded by former soldiers. And you could always tell them because they were quite brash, you know, they'd have a pistol hanging off their, off their thigh, you know, a big Jeep with a machine gun on the top. And um, <clears throat> it, it actually smelt like uh, a gold rush town. That's what, it, that's what it looked like. You know, I wasn't in San Francisco during the gold rush, but I imagine it was a similar kind of atmosphere. There was this sense that there was a lot of money to be, not made, taken. You could, just, you could smell it, you could sense it, this kind of grab going on. And uh, one of the aspects of my service in Iraq was that I felt that we were somehow involved in this, that through our action we were pacifying people so that these other people could come in and take as much as they could. Anyway, so I got accused of this and you know, that, that didn't stand up for too long. But the most difficult interview I had was with the Padre. In the, in the British Army, we call our chaplains the Padre. And I uh, got taken into this room and said, oh, Griff, this is all part of the process. You've got to uh, be interviewed by this Padre. And he started off by saying, ah, there was many people like you on the way down to the Falklands. People who were scared to fight. As I've met people like you before, but they, at least they did their job when we got down there. And I was trying to explain to him that when you're sneaking up to someone's house in the middle of the night, armed to the teeth, using explosives to get in someone's house whilst they're asleep, the threat to you is minimal. There, the threat to us in Iraq was minuscule compared to what it was to the civilian population. And he couldn't get grasp this, that this wasn't about the chance of me getting shot on the way into someone's house. This was about what we were doing to people. And uh, years later, I've spoken to many veterans who've been through similar processes to myself and they've all had the Padre interview, and they've all had a similar experience. A mate of mine who refused to go back to Northern Ireland in the late 1970s, early 1980s, was told by a Padre, you leave the army, you'll be dead in a year. You're, I can see you, you're gonna commit suicide. Another mate of mine who had applied for conscientious objector status for refusing to deploy to Afghanistan, um, the, after an interview with a naval chaplain, that chaplain wrote a report about him saying that Mr. Lyons or, you know, Seaman Lyons, as he were, was at the time, 
could not possibly have a conscientious objection to the war in Afghanistan because he is of no faith. <laughs> and these stories go on and on. Uh, and if you want to know a bit more about Padres within the British military, uh, everything you need to know about them is, is written on their cat badge, through God conquer. It's not a very Christian message, but that's what they wear. <laughs> so after a couple of months of this, um, I was told, you are now released from army service. Um, I wasn't punished. I was given the full set of benefits that I'd accrued during my time in the army and uh, was even sent on a course. I was sent down to London to find somewhere to live at their expense. And I think what was supposed to happen then was that I was supposed to go walking quietly off into a security job, not say anything else about Iraq and get on with my life. When I left, I was given a huge folder, A4 folder, with about 300, uh, who knows, maybe it was only 100, maybe it was only 50, I don't know, security firms to give my CV to. Most of them were operating in the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan. Some of them were operating in London. And that was the kind of the path that I was expected to go on, go and work for these companies. I did. I didn't know what I, wanted to, what I was going to do when I left the army. I never expected to leave the army. I thought I was going to be there for 22 years. Some of the first jobs I got when I left were working security in London. And I soon learned that if you need to pay 300 pounds a day per person for security in London, you're obviously up to no good. I was sent to uh, sit in a shareholders meeting where some old, I don't know what you'd call it, it's some old boys who had some money invested over a long period of time and that someone new had come onto the board and they were trying to convince them that they should sell up to this hedge fund. And it, 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 there wasn't a single person in the room younger than 60, but they had put us in the room and we're all sat there pretending to be shareholders or investors <laughs> dotted around in case they caused any trouble. <laughs> These old boys, you know. And, it was, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a scam, you know. I was sat there watching as this guy told these old boys about how he was going to make them all a fortune, but you could see he was just ripping them off. <coughs> Another one I was sent to was, I think it was Shell, a big um, shareholder meeting down in the Excel Centre, and um, sat in this huge room. There must have been, there must have been 2,000 people in there. And again, we're split up around in, in the audience, ready to you know, sort out any trouble. And um, all morning, people were standing up and saying, oh yeah, um, I'm from Sakhalin. I can't remember the details, so just bear with this. I'm from Sakhalin and uh, all the fish are dead in, in the bay there. I'm a fisherman, all the fish are dead. And then someone else says, I'm from Nigeria, there's oil running down the streets. I'm from Texas, the toxic fumes are killing my kids. All these different people were standing up, Alaska, all over the world, telling the uh, board of Shell about the effects of their sort of corporate policies. And I was sat there thinking, wow, that's terrible. That's terrible. By lunchtime, I was kind of nodding along with all this. And uh, a group of them stood up, took their shirts off, and they had T-shirts. Ken Sarawiwa, who is the uh, Nigerian poet activist who had been murdered by the Nigerian regime. And they started singing this song. And I think, this is great. <laughs> and then, my boss is going, get them out. What? Get them out? I thought, oh, no. So I've gone up to the first guy, beating his drum. I said, look, mate, I'm supposed to be getting you out of here. Um, can I, will you come out? I don't really want to manhandle you. He said, you just walk out with me, mate. We'll make it look like. So I sort of like held onto his arm and walked out at him, you know, pretending to hoik him out. Fair dues to him. He, he, he helped me out, no end. And that, that was the last security job I, I did in London. <laughs> so that's what I should have been doing. But after I left the army, um, I was at home, I was angry about what had happened, what I'd been involved in. I couldn't really um, fully appreciate what I'd been involved in. Over the years, I've built up a bigger picture. Imagine that I was just the, the French policeman taking the Jew out of the house. And over the years, you build up the picture, oh, this is what it was about, you know. And, um, but quite early on, I started to feel this obligation, duty, to start talking about what was going on over there. Because I was watching the news back home, listening to politicians, listening to generals, talking about the war in Iraq, and, and knowing, not just thinking, knowing that what they were saying was a load of old rubbish. 
you know, they were talking about how we were winning and how we were introducing democracy and things were getting better over there. And I was thinking, is this the same war they're talking about? And I started to, to talk in public meetings, uh, give interviews to the press. And this went on, you know, and I did think I was on my own for a while. And I got into all sorts of trouble. I won't go into that tonight. <clears throat> um, but it wasn't for quite a few years until um, other people, I became aware of other people who felt or thought the same. Um, I can't remember the exact year, but it was something like 2009 when Joe Glenton refused to, to go to Afghanistan, went AWOL, uh, ended up doing some prison time. And uh, at the same point, um, I was struggling with you know, the aftermath of Iraq, and I'd been sent to a couple of uh, psychologists, you know, kind of like, um, what's well, called combat stress, it's down in Leatherhead, like a military charity hospital for people suffering with what they call PTSD. It's a whole big other issue. <laughs> I don't call it PTSD. It's, it's not a disorder to feel like this <laughs> after going through that. It's, it's just normal. Um, whilst I was at Combat Stress, I started to meet other veterans, not just from the war in Iraq, but from the Falklands and from earlier, who thought and felt the same as I did. And started to think maybe it was possible that we could form a group. And over the next couple of years, we, we wrote a few letters and we, we started to meet up. And in 2011, I was given a talk in uh, Houseman's Books about the problem of the military going into schools and trying to recruit our kids. And there was a guy at the back nodding away and he looked like a kind of aging American footballer. Massive shoulders, massive jaw. You know. And afterwards he came up to me, he said, have you ever heard of an organisation called Veterans for Peace? I said, yeah, I have. I have heard of them. And I told him, oh, we're trying to get something started over here, you know, like a, a veterans group, you know, anti-war veterans group. He said, oh, well, you could, you could become part of Veterans for Peace. That was a guy called Barry Ladendorf. He's now the, the president of Veterans for Peace in America. And so rather than sort of like go through all the sort of birthing pains of setting up something completely new. Uh, we looked at their website, looked at all of their um, statement of purpose, statement on violence, and decided that this was actually what they were talking about was universal. It wasn't American Veterans for Peace, and none of their statement of purpose or uh, principles of nonviolence were specific to America. And so we set up a group, and we've been going now since 2011. Um, we're up to about 190 members, and one of the most interesting things for me um, is the wide variety of people we've got. So it's not just disgruntled Iraq war veterans, you know, post 9-11 <coughs> veterans. We, our oldest guy is Jim Radford. Excuse me. Um, he was at D-Day as a 15-year-old on a merchant tugboat. And his job was to, on this tugboat, was to drag the landing craft off, off the uh, beaches and then construct this Mulberry Harbour. That was his kind of task. And he had like this sort of grandstand view of, of D-Day. Uh, he let, later went on to join the Royal Navy and became uh, a prominent member within the Committee of the 100, CND. You know, he's been around for a long time. Jim was talking, actually I was out in America with him recently and he was talking and someone was mention, mentioned that word, the fallen, which I hate. The fallen, you know, that's, that's what you see in a war film. Someone gets shot, they fall over, they die, don't they, peacefully almost. And uh, we were talking about this term and how just like aim at the centre of the mass or collateral damage, it's a term that hides the true nature of what's going on. And he, t he started to tell a story, and that's the amazing thing about Veterans for Peace, is when, especially when we're on our own. People, it's not some sort of like swing the lantern, oh, listen to this. People just start talking about these things that they've been through. And he started talking about D-Day and he said, do you know what, on the second day of D-Day, there were all these bodies, British bodies, on the, on the beaches. And they got a, uh, a bulldozer and bulldozed the whole lot into a big pile and then just bur buried that pile. Now, I'm, I'm sure they, you know, took them out afterwards. But that, that was what we're talking about. He said there wasn't any fallen. Th this is what it was about. It's brutal. What were heating? who is in his 80s, uh, was, a, was in a national serviceman who deployed to Malaya in the late 40s. He was involved in um, attacking villages, burning their crops, burning their houses, and taking the villages uh, to concentration camps 
They weren't called concentration camps, but uh, there was a big wire fence and some huts inside and people weren't allowed out. It's kind of a concentration camp. Anyone who escaped was then hunted down and people who escaped from that camp tried to get back to their village. They were hunted down, I think by the Scots guards and uh, were massacred in a place called Batang Kali. Um, also in, in Malaya, people, uh, villages had their heads cut off by British soldiers. And when you hear these stories, people telling me about what happened in Cyprus, what happened in Northern Ireland in the early years, you start to realise that actually the, the history that you've been taught, the stories that you've heard, um, they're one side of the story. And then it's not just the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan that are decrepit, it's the whole lot, the whole, the whole lot of it. Even guys have been down to the Falklands and people often bring up the Falklands, you know, well, that was a just war. Well, none of my mates who were there think it was just. None of them. And they're not even, the, they're not even in VFP. They, these are not guys who are signed up to Veterans for Peace. 